thank you very much for having me. Um, Earth system modeling, I think, has become an, a very important tool in Earth and environmental sciences. We use them now to understand the system, addressing questions, for example, what Arctic sea ice decline has to do with extreme weather and climate here in Europe. We use them for predictions and some of the most high impactful events like, you know, hurricanes, which when they struck, strike, you know, come with a cost of tens of billions of uh, euros. We use the models to carry out climate change projections, very important. But we also use them to optimize observing systems, for example, and in a very smart way, combine them with observations for monitoring. So they have become absolutely critical. And if you look at the toolbox that we have at our hand here, we have theory that we can make use of to pro progress science. We have certainly the experimentation. These are the two classical branches, if you will. We do have computer simulation and data science, which I think are fueled by the digitalization. That's the emergence of microprocessors. Okay? And in my presentations, I think acknowledging that most of the people will be addressing the data science part, I will be focusing here on computer simulations. And what's at the heart of simulation is that we know the equations that govern the problem. Okay? What we don't know is the exact solution. Okay, and that's where computer simulation comes into play. So let me start and bring up some equations. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this guy up there, Wilhelm Diagnes, was the one who laid and sort of formulated the equations that govern the evolution of the atmosphere and the ocean. These are our governing equations. Now there's a problem with those equations, and these are nonlinear terms. Okay. That's what's causing all the trouble. And it has been described by John van Neumann, you know, solving a linear versus a nonlinear equation as follows. Solving a linear equation is finding your way out of a maze, an ear garden, that is very complex, difficult but doable. Solving a nonlinear equation is finding your way out of a maze that changes with every step. The solution depends on where you are. And that makes the problem very difficult. Now, there are two ways you can go about. You can simplify the equation, linearize them. That's what I'm doing Wednesday afternoons with my physics students at the University of Bremen. And there's another route that has been proposed by John von Neumann, pictured up here, and that is using supercomputers. Okay? And that's the first one, the ENIAC, that he used for basically two purposes nuclear physics in the context of the Manhattan Project, and secondly, issuing the first weather forecasts. And I think, you know, weather and climate and earth system modelers working at the forefront with people in, in you know, developing and running the hardware has been a model of success ever since. And I think that, you know, the whole field there has been a, a story of success, and this is um, a graph from a paper of a colleague of mine, actually in Helmholtz International Fellow, Peter Bauer, and he had a nature paper saying numerical, entitling numerical weather prediction, the quiet revolution. And it shows this skill as a function of time going gradually every year, incrementally going up, you know, over, um, over time. And sort of after 30 days of work and research, you know, we have gained skill of something like three days in weather prediction. Now, probably that's difficult to grasp. Let me explain it slightly differently. People waking up on the 9th of September 1900 in Galveston, a city in Texas close to the Gulf of Mexico, didn't know that later that day a Hurricane 4 would be making landfall, which resulted in the deadliest, still the deadliest natural disaster in the US ever. Okay, nowadays we take seven, even ten day forecast, skillful forecast for, for granted. And I think there's still scope for further improvement. Um, there's certainly, um, going back, I mean, you know, the whole field of climate science I think has been a success, you know, using models to demonstrate that humankind can change the climate. I think that's well established now and models have been influential. But not all, not all is bright, there's scope for improvement. And, uh, you know, I would argue that some critical processes are not represented in the models yet by the law of physics, what we would like to do and sometimes claim, but by you know, empirical rep uh, representations. There are persistent systematic errors. Some of the errors that models are having are larger than the, the, the signal you want to predict. And in nonlinear systems, that is cause for concern. 
So there, these all results in large uncertainties in regional climate change projections and also limiting, uh, limitations when it comes to our ability to predict extreme events, which is something that is of extreme importance to society. Okay, so what can be done to improve models? I think there are different routes to follow, but in the spirit of the theme of this Helmholtz Horizons event, I would focus on the increase in spatial resolution, sort of, you know, resolving more of the physics. And let me explain briefly by the following graph. Here you see grids of uh, different models, the ones used in the upper left corner here uh, in the 1990s, and then, you know, the sort of smaller and smaller uh, boxes as we progress in time. Now the situation is, if you have a box, you have to imagine that the weather parameters or the ocean parameters are all the same within the box. Temperature, winds, all the same. Now, having large boxes has an advantage that you have few equations to solve, so you can lose small computers. But it comes as a price that you somehow have to parameterize or represent the impact of these small processes you haven't resolved. So we made progress in the years, uh, and uh, there is more progress to come, but I think even for the next upcoming IPCC report, we won't be going beyond resolutions of 30 kilometers, perhaps except for a few research applications, but I will coming back to this. And I think we should be going more towards something like a kilometer model, okay? But I will be coming back to this. So, talking a bit about my activities modeling at the Alfred Wigner Institute, we have developed um, a sea ice ocean model, okay, called FESOM, formulated on finite elements. You may ask, why do we need another sea ice ocean model? There are already quite a few. What is novel about this? It's formulated on unstructured meshes. So what we can do is we can put the resolution where it matters and you know, keep it coarse elsewhere, you know, if you find good reason for that. Uh, and it also scales very well. You know, it can make use, effective use of the, the new kind of supercomputers we are having. We have developed something like a follow-on, which is three times faster. We coupled it to other Earth system components, which brings us to a climate model and an Earth system model. Now, to give you just a feeling of what we can do, I would like to show you the mesh resolution of you know, one of our workhorses. And this shows you, you know, the size of the boxes, if you will. And you see blue in the tropics, you know, corresponding to box sizes of something like 20 kilometers and going to four and uh, smaller if we go to the north. And we do this because the typical scales of the waves and the eddies have exactly that resolution. So we, we, we target the resolution to properly represent the physics that's there. Okay, so how are we doing? How realistic is the model? Uh, and for this, you know, I would like to play a little game with you, if you will, okay? What you see here are ocean currents at the surface. The lighter, the faster the current, okay? And there are three simulations and one satellite product, okay? Can you spot the satellite? Probably, you know, uh, for the guided eye, you will probably do. I think it's fairly straightforward to discard the upper one. You know, there's you know, nothing like the Gulf Stream, if you will. That's how the world looks like in a typical CMIP-5 model, the model we used as input for the latest assessment report. That's what most people will use for the next assessment report. You know, adding motion, developing, I would think probably not quite there. Uh, this is a satellite, by the way, an altimeter, okay, and that's what we call frontier meshes. That's the frontier of science, you know, and I think things become very similar and very realistic. Now, we can even say that these kind of models start to pass what some people call the climate Turing test, and perhaps that needs a bit of explanation. What is a Turing test? You know, uh, Turing addressed the, the problem, you know, how can you tell how smart artificial intelligence is. And he said, okay, well, you take a machine, you take a person, and you ask them question, and, you know, judged by, you know, whether you can, by the answer, take them apart or not tell them apart, you can decide how smart they are. And this concept has been taken forward by Tim Palmer and said, you know, our models need to, to you know, as a necessary condition, pass this Turing test. And I think we are getting there. That's the point I would like to make. Now, this is a simulation, an animation here. Um, uh, with this kind of meshes, and you see rich dynamics here, the Gulf Stream here, Agulas, the Southern Ocean is full, and we, are, we know the El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomenon. we have also very exciting wave events. Now, probably people in the field have seen these kind of animations before, you know, other people can do that as well, but I would argue that we can do that um, uh, with, a, with a throughput that others can't. You know, by taking 80,000, you know, cores, compute cores, we can run these kind of simulations 
applications for 44 years in a day. That means in a matter of days we can run you know, throughout the 21st century and do proper science with this. Okay. I think I find this also a very interesting view. If we consider this very similar to what a satellite would see of Earth, we can look into the future and see how does Earth look like in 2100. You know, if the thermal hairline circulation has come, you know, reduced or came, come to a hold, we can use this kind of model to get a, a different view and perhaps also different, uh, communicate climate change in a completely different way. Um, are there any impacts on other impacts on climate change projections? Um, the answer is yes, and I want to show you uh, this briefly here. So here's a low resolution picture on the left hand side, so state of the art, if you will, of how surface temperatures will change in the future. Uh, you see something like Arctic amplification, you see a warming over the continents compared to the ocean, but generally uh, there's a warming here and a cooling blob in the North Atlantic, which has to do with the slowdown of the overturning circulation. Okay? If we go to the high resolution picture here, the situation is very similar, except for the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean, when you have ocean eddies, doesn't warm towards the 21st century. It doesn't warm. And if you look at the sea ice, I don't show it to you, it doesn't decline as it does in the other models, you know, which is in contradiction to what satellite data are telling us. This may also have implications for you know, the water that's reaching the ice shelves and has having implications for you know, the projections of uh, sea level, for example. So I think some of these simulations suggest, you know, going to this resolution radically changes the answer uh, we get uh, for future projections. So what next? I think we need to explore these kind of models and do forefront science. I think a lot is to be gained by them. Um, we also need to prepare our system, Earth system models for even higher resolution. I think the one kilometer is really uh, what we want to have. Uh, in order to go from simple parameterization really to having the laws of physics in our model. That's the way forward. And we have to do it quickly because the questions we are addressing are urgent. Um, and this will lead us to much improved capabilities in predicting extreme events. So there are, and I'm coming close to the end, there are opportunities and challenges. I mean, op the opportunity is exascale computing. Okay, that's what we want. But it's a challenge as well. And I think it has been brought to the point in the latest issue of The New Scientist from October. Could the world's mightiest computers be too complicated to use? I think it brings it to the point. Okay. And it has to do with the end of Moore's law. You know, we need more processes, we need diverse processes. Also, the end of Dennard scaling means things are becoming expensive. We need different kind of uh, processing units. But there are other challenges like what's coming out of those models will be truly big. Who can handle this? Which stakeholder can handle this? Mighty challenges. Now, we have ideas and challenges, and uh, there's a proposal by the international community for an FAT flagship. These are these science and technology-driven research initiatives built around visionary unifying goals and that tackle these grand challenges. So I think we have teamed up with the right players uh, uh, to move this forward. Um, I mean, that's, that's clear to say. And really find solutions like rewriting the whole code, the models, you know, to make them fit for the future. It also means revisit the whole workflow from taking the observations, confronting them with the models towards impact model. It's a complete redesign of the workflow that is required. Which brings me to my last slide. I think we as a community, we are prepared. We have plans up our sleeves, which are, you know, formulated in that proposal uh, uh, to take the, you know, the opportunities that come with exascale computing and turn them into opportunities for the benefit of science and society. Thank you very much.